3, the verses 12 through 16. Verse 12 to 16. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward for what, to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In response to the reading of the sermon, we will sing hymn 36, verses 1 through 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are getting to the time of year many people decide to make what are commonly called New Year's resolutions. They resolve to get more exercise, eat healthier, quit smoking, whatever the case might be. Many people seem to think that the Christian life is all about living by resolutions too. A lot of people think that the Christian life is a matter of doing or not doing certain things. But does the Bible really call us to do this, to live a resolution-type Christianity? Well, the answer depends on what you mean by a resolution and, of course, how you plan to achieve that resolution. If you think that you must, in your own power, conform to a certain list of do's and don'ts, then you are setting yourself up for failure. But if you plan by God's grace and with his power to live a life of steady and persistent obedience, then you are making the right kind of resolution. That's the kind of resolution our text calls us to do. And that brings us to the theme of the sermon, press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Do this first by confessing what you are not, and second, by knowing what you already are, and third, believing what you will become. First, confess what you are not. The Christian life is not meant to be lived in short and vigorous bursts of frantic obedience, but living for Christ has to do with a lifetime of living in the right direction, one day at a time, one year at a time. It's not so much the ability to make resolutions, but the Christian life is lived by the power which God supplies by his spirit, as Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There are not a few people who think that Christian living is very much different than this. Too many people see Christianity as a form of living by a few New Year's type resolutions that get a shot in the arm every Sunday morning. We easily fall into this trap too. Instead of seeing Christianity as a life-changing event, we all too easily fall into the trap of living according to the externals. As long as someone comes to church every Sunday and lives according to a few other expected conditions, then it must be okay with that person. But the life-changing experience of being born again is not simply a one-time event. But becoming a Christian and living the Christian life is about entering a lifelong battle of making a lifelong commitment to live as one who has been purchased by the blood of Christ. We can learn this clearly from the life of Paul, and very much so from this chapter in Philippians. In Philippians 3, verse 2, 
Paul warns, look out for the dogs. Who are these dogs? We don't know their names, but the readers would have known. They were religious busybodies, focused on an external form of religion, saying that Christians all had to be circumcised and live according to the Jewish laws and customs of the Old Testament. But Paul warns his readers, don't get sucked in by this. You didn't come to faith in Christ that way. The mark of your new life in Christ is not made by a knife. It's not by the circumcision of the flesh, but by the Spirit of Christ. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. They worship the Lord Jesus, and they are not the kind of people who boast in externals, in their circumcision, or in their church attendance, or whatever it might be they boast of. And note the irony. If they have reason to boast, Paul has more. He has the right kind of pedigree and education, the right kind of religious philosophy, etc. And as to the requirements of the law, he was perfect. He says, here are all my credentials, doing the right things, learning the right things, understanding the right things. I thought all these things may be acceptable with God, but I count them as rubbish. I used to be so proud of myself, but now I tore up my resume. It's garbage. All the things I was so proud of, all the things I thought I could chalk up to my own righteousness, it's all in the trash bin. Why? So that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I'm no longer interested in external righteousness, but in the righteousness that comes by faith. I want to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own. And then, what does Paul write next? Let's take a look at verse 9 and 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. What a staggering statement. Paul is saying, I once thought I was righteous, but I wasn't. I was totally wrong. And now that I have discovered what it means to be in Christ, now the longing of my life is to participate in the suffering of Christ. When you listen to this statement, you get a sense that we have here a little glimpse of the greatness of the apostle. And you say to yourself, wow, do you hear what Paul is longing for? I don't even come close to that. This man, he really understands what it means to want the right thing, to live close to Jesus. How am I ever going to live like that? But then, just when we start wondering about what we have to keep on reading, Paul assures us that he has not reached this goal yet. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. And then in verse 13, he says, Brothers, I do not, do not consider it that I have made it my own. I have not yet arrived. Paul doesn't have it all together. He's not an expert. He doesn't have the Christian life all down pat. He is confessing what his life is not. And that's encouraging for us, congregation. Because let's be honest, it's really discouraging to think that everyone else must have it all together. You look around in church on Sunday morning and you see families walking in, dressed nicely. Dad and mom are smiling and you think to yourself, I sure wish I had it all together like they do. My life's a mess compared to them. Or perhaps you wish you had a strong faith like your grandparents. It's no fun playing on a team where everyone else is better than you. But Paul says, just in case you think I'm still bragging, I'm not. Let me tell you about the fact I have not yet obtained all this. Let me be honest about my progress. I am far from perfect. I have not yet fulfilled I have not yet fully arrived spiritually. That must be our confession too. Even though we are in Christ, we have not yet fully arrived. 
we have not reached the goal of perfection, but neither has anyone on this side of the grave. But that shouldn't keep us from striving. It didn't stop Paul either. I keep on going, and I am seeking to get a hold of that which Jesus Christ has gotten a hold of for me. Second, know what you already are. What's Paul referring to here? For what purpose did Christ get a hold of for Paul? Well, Paul must have been thinking here of his Damascus Road experience. Why did Jesus stop him on the road to Damascus? Paul hated Christians, and he was on his way to arrest and kill Christians. But Jesus arrested Paul and said, I have a different purpose for you. You are going to be my apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was trying to stamp out all, his, all this Christian nonsense, but Jesus met him and stopped him and laid a hold of Paul. And that's why Paul can strive for what Christ has already obtained for him. Paul is not striving for a potential prize, but for a guaranteed prize. How does he know this? He has absolute security because he knows that Christ has called him and Christ has laid hold of him. So he knows what and who he is. He already knows this. When Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, he told him, you will do what I will tell you and you will be told what to do. Jesus laid hold of Saul of Tarsus and that's why Paul has every reason to strive for the prize, to press on toward the goal. So let me ask you, do you know and believe that the Lord has laid hold of you? The question is not, are you a religious person? Not, do you go to church? Not, do you think you're an upstanding member of the church? But has the Lord laid hold of you? Have you been grasped by Christ? Do you understand what that means? It is perfectly clear to you that you cannot please God in any way by striving to please yourself, please him yourself. It is clear to you that the description of a sinner applies to you. Do you understand that nothing good lives in you that is in your sinful self? Do you believe that the Christ who died for sinners died for you? And is that what motivates you and identifies you and gives you reason to get up every day? Do you believe that Christ has taken the burden of guilt from your shoulders? And does that relief cause you inexplicable joy? Is that what gives you joy and happiness? And does that truth change everything for you? Because that's what it means to be born again. That's what gives you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Boys and girls, young people of the church, what about you? Has Christ taken hold of you? What is it that makes you a Christian boy or girl? Is it that you go to catechism class every week? Or that you go to church with your parents? Or to a Christian school? What makes you a Christian? Do you ever give that some thought? I hope you do. Maybe you think of being a Christian as having to do this or that, making sure that you don't do certain things, and making sure that you, at the very least, do some religious activity. Perhaps you think that being a Christian means that you generally act and talk like the other people in the church, that you make sure you sort of do the same things and act the same way. But that's not what it means to be taken hold of by Christ. Being taken hold of by Jesus means that you believe Jesus knows who you are, that he knew which parents you were going to have, and that he knew you before you were even baptized. Do you believe the promises you received in your baptism, that God wants to be your father, that your sons are, sins are washed away in the blood of Christ, and that the Holy Spirit promises to dwell in you and that he joins you to Christ? 
He draws you to himself with cords of life, love, a love that is even greater than the love your parents have for you. Do you believe that? And when you believe that, is that what makes you live the way you do? Do you live to take hold of what has been promised to you by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Has Christ taken hold of your life? And are you allowing your life to be taken hold of by him? Because you have, if you have been taken hold of by Christ, then that's the other side of it. You have to let your life be taken hold of by him. You're in a race. When Christ takes hold of you, you're in the race of your life. You haven't finished yet, but you are called to strive for that which has already been obtained for you. The Christian journey is a race, and Paul is in no doubt that he's in the race, but he still hasn't crossed the finish line. I have not yet made it my own, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize. He hasn't crossed the line. He still isn't there, but he keeps running. When we are Christians, we are in the race, and that race is tough sledding. The struggle against sin and temptation isn't over. In fact, when you are a Christian, that is when the struggle begins. That's when the race starts. Because if Christ has not laid hold of you, there's no need to run, because then there's no prize to be gained. But if Christ has laid hold of you, then you can run the race with confidence. And so Paul is trying to encourage his readers Paul wanted to make sure his readers would not be discouraged by thinking that because they had still not reached perfection, therefore they weren't good enough to play on the team. And he did not want them to get upset by the barking dogs of verse 2 who boasted in their own perfectionism. They were suggesting that perfection in the Christian life is Jesus plus something else, Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus rules, Jesus plus a special experience. But the truth is that the Christian life is all about Jesus. He is the beginning and the end of Christian life. Other forms of religion have to do with rules and schemes. But if any man or woman, boy or girl, is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And while our text is full of encouragement, it also calls for honest self-examination. Am I in Christ? What am I running for? Where is my heart? Is your heart in the things of this earth? Are you just running for your own little empire? Are you running to get the best out of life? Are you running for your reputation? Is that your goal, to make sure others think well of you? If you are, then you're in deep trouble. Our text, in fact, the entire Bible, calls us to be realistic and honest about our progress. Ask yourself, where am I? The Bible says we're in a race. So, where are you? Are you running or are you sitting in the stands? Have you decided to get off the track because you're upset with your wife or your husband or because you're upset with brother X or sister Y? If you don't like the way things are in your life or in the church, do you think you have the right to just get off the track and stop running? Or do you think it's just not worth the sweat and the effort? After all, things are much more comfortable off the racetrack. It's good to take stock of where you are and how far you've come, because if you don't know where you've come from and you don't know where you are, then how can you know where you're going? Paul is honest about his lack of progress, but he's also clear about where he's going. He doesn't let anything get him off the course. He has one aim, knowing Christ. It's his all-consuming passion, and he has a plan. One thing I do, I press on. He has an object and a goal. Many of us have plans, plans for marriage, plans for buying a house, a plan for physical fitness. Maybe you have many plans for the new year. 
But do you have a plan for your walk with the Lord? How many of us actually have a plan for our Christian life? It shouldn't matter where you are or what you're doing in life. There's one thing that you strive for. Paul is in jail when he writes this letter to the Philippians. But even then he says, one thing I do. Boys and girls, young people of the church, this is not something you can leave until you become an adult. It's one thing if you're not sure what kind of career choice you want to make, or you're not sure where you want to live, but if you are in Christ, then at the very least you should know this one thing, that you are determined to run the race that God has set before you. Tell yourself, no matter what I become, a doctor or a lawyer or a baker or a candlestick maker, I'm going to do this one thing. If I live in Manitoba or Africa, I will do this one thing. If I get married or not, I will do this one thing. Why? Because it is mine already for Christ, has li- for Christ has laid hold of it for me. And with God helping me, I will press on and win the goal, the prize which God has in store for me. It doesn't matter where God calls you to serve. This is the one thing you can and must do. And I will especially address the young men among us. We live in a time where so many young people, but especially young men, are aimless and live without purpose, content to live from paycheck to paycheck, as long as they get to play their precious video games and just hang out with their friends. We live in a generation in which so many boys are not growing up, but remain perpetual teenagers. They don't know what to live for, and they don't understand the meaning of the word commitment. I pray that it is not that bad in the church, but this does beg the question, young men, what are you living for? Young men, are you in the race, or are you on the sidelines? Do you know what it means to be a Christian man? Do you know that someday you are expected to be leaders in your home, in the church, and in society? And fathers, are we teaching and showing our sons what it means to be a Christian man? Is there any passion for God and for the name of Christ? And if you are passionate, what are you passionate about? Does anybody still get excited about defending the name of God? Does anyone still have a passion for serving Christ and knowing him? Do you count everything as rubbish in order that you might gain Christ and be found in him? If there is one thing in your life, what is that one thing? If there is anything that you would give your life for? And if there is, what would be that one thing? Is there anything at all in this world that you would be willing to live without for the sake of knowing Christ? Or are there things in this life that you would never give up for Jesus? Brothers and sisters, young people of the church, the basis of Christian life is knowing Jesus, his grace, his love and mercy, his power, and his spirit. He is the one who cleanses you and cleans up your life. I know that you can never live your life to perfection, but you, you can't live a perfect life, but you can give your life to Christ. You can follow him. There are so many dead ends we can follow, so many places and things to do that are just a waste of time. But there is only one thing that is really worth doing, and that is pressing onward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It might involve saying goodbye to a lot of things. Forget what lies behind our mistakes, our failures, but also the achievements that make us proud. Forget about the things you have already accomplished. In other words, don't rest on your laurels. You can't stop running. You can only run the race if you keep on looking ahead. Fix your eyes on the prize that God has in store for you. Believe that you will become. Believe what you will become because in reality it is already yours.
Third, believe what you will become. And what is this prize? It is described in the Bible in many ways. It means to hear your Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. It is to receive the unfading crown of glory, as noted in 1 Peter 5, verse 4. It is the everlasting peace, the everlasting presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to eat from the tree of life. It is to rule with Christ forever. It's a prize so good and so great that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what it is. But we can be sure of one thing. God has prepared such a prize for those who love him. We, do, we don't even know how good the prize will be, how awesome the prize will be. And there are days when att- obtaining the prize might seem like a pipe dream. You know those kinds of days when you've messed up so bad that you're looking in the mirror and ask yourself, how in the world does God have the patience to put up with such a miserable and ungrateful wretch like me? Do I really think that God is going to reward me with a prize? Forget it, man. There's just no way. Maybe he'll give Paul a prize, or the Apostle John or Peter, but not me. But that, beloved congregation, is the language and thought process of unbelief and doubt. When you believe in Jesus Christ, there is a prize, and your name is written on that prize. When Jesus calls you to run the race, the prize is included with the call. You may not know exactly what it is, but when you receive it, it will be the best prize ever, because God has prepared it just for you. And so we can be sure of the prize, because when God calls, he includes the prize in the call. He did that for Israel too. In the Old Testament, he called his people out of Egypt and to the promised land. That was the prize. The people didn't know exactly which part of the prize they were going to receive, but they had to strive to get there, and they had to strive to enter the land. It didn't go without effort on their part. They had to make it their own because God had made them his own. They had to fight for it, but the outcome was certain and predetermined. And that's why it's so very important to be committed to obtaining what God has already obtained for us, not just for yourself, but for the sake of others too. If you are not committed to striving for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, then how can you expect to persuade others to do the same? If you are not climbing upward, do you expect your children to climb upward or your grandchildren? If you are not climbing upward, how will you encourage your fellow believers to climb? So are you striving to climb? Or as one author put it, you have flattened out at your cruising altitude. You see, it doesn't matter how high you are as long as you're still climbing. But all too often we stop climbing and remain content at a cruising altitude, content to come to church every week and then go back to the same old, same old. So are you climbing or have you flattened out? Remember, There are many who travel the broad road, but few find the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. When Israel arrived at the Jordan River, at the threshold of the Promised Land, 12 spies went into the land of Canaan, and when they came back, 10 of them said, it's not worth the effort. 10 of the 12 thought the guaranteed prize wasn't worth striving for. A prize promised by God himself. Only two of the 12 said, Let's start climbing to the promised land. So will you join the ten, or will you join the two? You could stay with the crowd, hang out with them, do what they do, say what they say, think like they think, or will you join the two? Will you join those who strive for the prize that God has in store for you? Perhaps those ten men thought they had come far enough. They had made enough progress. But look what happened to them. They did not receive the prize. They obviously didn't think the prize was worth the effort, and they were so close, just across the border. 
they had even had a chance to see the prize for themselves. Brothers and sisters, pray that would never be said of you that you threw away the prize when it was already yours. Pray for the grace to make steady progress. Pray for the grace to be honest with yourself, to be able to say, I am not there yet. Pray for the help of God so that you will continue striving, straining forward toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, knowing that he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Knowing that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, verse 6. You have the promise. The prize is as real as the call. So strive with courage. Strive with assurance. Strive with joyful expectation. And take hold of that which has already been taken hold of for you. Paul adds in verse 17... Join in intimidating me, in imitating, sorry, in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Imitate Paul and so many others who have already won the prize. During the past year, many people we know have already won the prize. They have gone before us. They have finished the race. By God's grace, they have finished and reached the finish line. For us, the prize is still to be won. May the Lord find us striving not only tomorrow and in the new year, but always striving for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Let us be resolved to do this one thing. Amen.